Nemo Radio is on the air. A, B, C. A, always B, B, C. Closing. Always be closing. Always be closing. Surely you can't be serious. I am serious. And don't call me Shirley. Put that coffee down. Coffee's for closers only. Come after me! I'm a man! I'm 40! All right, welcome back to another episode of Nemo Radio. So excited to have a special guest. He's been on before, but he's back. He's bigger. He's better than ever. Again, it's... <laughs> come on, Charles. Don't step on my touchdown call. I'm your hype man right now. Charles oh, Alexander is joining us. You got to meet this guy. Um, if you haven't listened to him before on Nemo Radio, he's got a brand new book out, which I'm su- super excited about. But quick introduction so that you know who Charles is and what he's all about. Charles Alexander's mission in life, I love this, is to help entrepreneurs get focused and beat the odds of business failure. Charles is the director of Small Business Development Center uh, at Volunteer State College. He provides one-on-one business coaching. He teaches seminars. He's worked with over 2,000 entrepreneurs, so he knows his stuff. And most importantly, I have seen Charles start and scale a very successful side hustle, which we'll talk about, into you know a really thriving business without having to quit his day job, without having to take all the crazy risks. And Charles has a new book out that we want to talk about. It's called Start Now, Quit Later, which is such a great title. And it's really kind of your step-by-step guide um, into this. So Charles Alexander, welcome back to the show. John Nemo, thanks for having me, my friend. How have you been? I've been good. I've been good. I'm excited to dive into this um, because... For those that don't know, Charles and I have known each other, gosh, for probably almost a decade. We're in, we have the We're same business it. coach. We're in coaching groups and masterminds. Um, so we've been able to kind of follow each other's journeys. And it's it's been really fun for me to kind of see the evolution of Charles and where he's been and, you know, and where you are now with launching a book and coaching and all this. So let's, let's dive in, man. I think let's start with your story. Like, give us your background. Start sure. with the day of your birth and move forward one day at a Boy, time. Well, that's interesting, isn't it? Man, I've made I've got my own podcast. I've made that mistake once or twice. I won't do it again. So I'll give you the Cliff Notes version. Give us the Cliff Notes. Yes. And I, I grew up in the middle of nowhere. Uh, you know, the smallest, basically the smallest town that could have a school in the state of Tennessee. But my parents always had uh businesses. And I say that my dad, you know, kind of followed somewhat of the book, you know, way before then, where he had, you know, this business uh, or a job working for the local hospital over accounts receivable, but he could see the writing on the wall where he would make too much money and they'd lay him off and he'd go to the next one. And he got tired of it and he bought into a Curtis Mathis franchise. Did you remember though, the Curtis Mathis TV? No. Oh my God. Well, maybe it was just a, a Southeast thing, but okay. they were the best TVs in the world. They would last forever, which is a great product, but a terrible business model. So he ended up reinventing that business over and over. And I could see as a kid, man, this business stuff, I don't want anything to do with this. This looks stressful. So I went all through college, graduated. I you know, became a, a trainer, which I love. I love talking to people, showing them how to do stuff, telling stories, all relatable. And once upon, you know, after, after years of that training, serve pro franchisees that just bought a new business, I fell backwards into entrepreneurship again. And this time as a small business development center counselor. So I did that for several years where we meet and talk and discuss how do you start a business? How do you grow a business, have workshops? And then I got the itch, as you well know, about, you know, eight, nine years ago to launch my own business. I'm tired of talking about it. Can I do it? And I created a business where I create explainer videos for busy professionals. Even that's how I got really introduced to John and got in his world. I started making him videos uh, without his permission and uh, told him, said, man, you, you, you really want to be my friend, John. Uh, so I did that, had the highs and lows of it, but grew the thing uh, to where, you know, it's a fully functional business. And now it runs, you know, very automated, very delegated with little interference for me, still have the job. And then in addition to that, now I'm growing my own business coaching practice. Man, it's it's been fun to watch and it's been fun to see. And I'm excited to, to kind of dive into the book because I, you have I've heard you talk about some of the different lessons and things, but I, I've never 
had the opportunity to kind of have you distill it down, you know? And so this sure. is kind of what I like about this book is it's very much, it's you, right? So there's a lot of humor and a personality and storytelling. So it's an easy, fun read, but it's also like very practical. So I want to get into some of these questions because obviously our, the audience for Nemo radio is a mix of folks, small, sure. you know, small business owners, coaches, consultants, but we also have a lot of executives, a lot of up and coming people, a lot of people yeah. who are tinkering and wondering, and can I scale this? Can I start this? I have an idea. Will it work? What are uh, some of the top reasons, you know, you've worked with over 2000 entrepreneurs, yeah. so you've seen it all. Like what are some of the top reasons startups fail? Oh my gosh. That, I mean, and that could be its own podcast, but yeah. it, it boils down to a thing, a series of things that we just lack. And as silly as it sounds, you lack experience out of the gate and it, and it's like being a parent for any if anybody who's been a parent. You can read all the books, all the blogs, and man, we did it. I got three kids. And we're not farmers. We just, you know, we just had three kids. I quit. They're 14, about to be 12 and 10. And it's you you can't get experience until you gain experience. And one of the big issues that a lot of entrepreneurs will face is that they want to chase their passion, which is nice. Uh and You'll, you know, I know John has, has got to read some of the book. He can get to read every bit of it. But I use John Nemo as an example in the book about what? Wait, what? About chasing your passion. You wanted to right sell now. this book. What are you doing, dude? dude? You're going the wrong way. You're scaring well, them off. I love it. Well, but when people chase their passion, they don't always have the skill set to do so. Like right. me, I love football. I love fantasy football. Well, I'm not going to go make a living playing fan duels regularly, but. You know, you might you might be able to pull some experienced career capital that you have to the table in order to create and grow a business. When I was talking about, I used you as an example. You were a writer. Well, if you were to think writer plus LinkedIn done for you, it wouldn't have matched. But you've taken that skill set over and over with books, webinars, ebooks, all the tips, tricks, guides, templates, and you've turned it into that. And you do it for other people. So it's using, you know, it's your passion, but it's more importantly, your skill set. And now John is the most passionate guy out there when it comes to LinkedIn. So one of the first things you lack is experience. And then we lack planning. People will think about something, they'll talk about it, they'll pray about it. But brother, they won't plan anything. They'll just reverberate that through their mind over and over. I always use the example that uh, since we have all these kids, uh, that means we go to Disney sometimes because I hate money. Uh, so we'll go to Disney. Dude, we went on a Disney cruise and my wife, the ultimate planner, planned the Disney cruise, which needs no planning. You know, it's a cruise. You show up and they herd you around like cattle. You do what they say, when they say, and that's all you have to do. Now for my wife, she's a, a bookkeeper, has her own business. So she had spreadsheets for every day that we were on this doggone cruise ship. I knew where we were going, what characters we were, we were going to meet. I knew what character I had to dress up like every night because, you know, we're that family. Uh, I was uh, grumpy from the seven dwarfs, by the way. Couldn't couldn't imagine why. Uh, but she had done more planning for that seven-day cruise that needed no planning than a uh, majority of the business I work with do to start and launch the business. And just, you know, I won't take up the whole podcast, but, you know, people lack capital. I remember you talking about when you launched your business. It was it was tight. You had a little money saved, but not a lot. And most folks, they they that's why I love the idea of starting a business while you still have a job so you can have somewhat of a safety net. Uh, and then lastly, you know, man, people lack confidence and nobody will ever say that out loud. You know, I, I we overuse the term fear and punch fear in the face. But look, anxiety and worry is legit, especially when you have other mouths to feed and you have a mortgage. Uh that's, again, why I love the idea of maybe hang on to that job and test the business on the side so your confidence will be somewhat built in. I love that. Yeah, and it reminds me of one of my own failures because I'm all I'm here to embarrass myself on my own yeah. podcast. You do great. <laughs> uh, fired up. I had this whole thing early on. Oh, yeah. And, and it's about the lesson here of why startups fail is pursuing your passion, but also what do people want to pay you for? Right. That that was the painful lesson. I remember going to a mastermind with Ray Edwards, right? When I was first starting, I, mm -hmm. I did affiliate selling so I could get into a mastermind with these guys that were doing seven figures a year. And I was like, okay, I have this LinkedIn thing and yeah, I have a book and people want keep giving me money and courses, but I really want to do this thing called Fired Up because my passion was mindset and inspiring people and, you know, living your best life. And so I wrote a whole book and I created a whole course and all this stuff about pouring all my passion in. And they just looked at me and Ray Edwards said to me, he goes, 
you know, what you're telling me as far as already what's happening with LinkedIn and then this fired up, he's like, that's like saying you want to build a, a gas station on top of a cold gold mine. He's like, right. just so you know, I'm like, you guys don't know, like I'm going to show. And I went out and fired up was a colossal failure, mm-hmm. a failure in the sense of, right. Almost no one bought the course or the book sure. or anything because people didn't want it. People didn't want to buy that type of product or service mindset coaching, whatever. Like, what kept happening was people kept wanting to give me money for LinkedIn. Like no matter right. what I did, people kept coming and giving me money for that. And That's so right. finally, to your point, Charles, I married my passion, married my things I love to a product that fit the market that people were like, I want leads. I want them from LinkedIn. And now I have fun doing it. But that that's a great analogy you use. So mm. I, I want to dive into this about testing because you alluded great, to that great in your segue. answer. Yeah, and, and you said, you know, what's one thing you should never do when you're testing a business idea? The one thing you should never do, and you'll be able to tell another story, and if you don't tell it, I'll tell it on you, is build an entire product or service system completely and put all the bells, all the whistles, everything without friggin' testing it first. And when I say testing it, not your great aunt Linda, who loves everything you do. I got, man, I'm gonna keep harping on this. I got this book coming out. I'm hammering my friends and family who either already own a business or are near retirement and aren't gonna start one to buy one just because I need a little juice getting out of the gate. But that's how people test stuff all the time. Charles, you, man, we're, we're gonna be on fire. We're opening up this catering place and it's got a a food truck and we're going to host this and everybody loves this special brownie recipe. Like, ah, it's cool that, you know, everybody at at dinner on the grounds on Sunday at church lapped it up, but that's not testing it, dude. Uh, So for, for me, I have my own personal example. I have a, my explainer video business. I have a monthly financial advisor plug and play video. I make it's one video. I brand it for a variety of different advisor and it's on a topic of the month that people are worried about. So over the past year, it's been about, hey, you should really stay in the market because timing, it's almost impossible. Well, after that was done and I tested it, man, I didn't build anything out. Just one little video here, one little video there. And I tested, 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 boom, finally caught hold. So I thought, man, I'm pretty smart. I'm going to do this for insurance agents. And I literally, I got a couple on the phone, asked them leading questions that give me the answers I wanted to hear. So Voila, I'm a genius. I went out and created the insurance plug and play model, built it out from top to bottom, dozens of videos. And John, you know how many I sold out of that? Two. <laughs> Dude, it fell. Was Pete Podgy one of them? No, Pete Podgy wasn't one of them. <laughs> <laughs> well, you did stuff with Pete, though. I was going to say, I've made so many custom created for that fine gentleman. He didn't need to. Pete's but I was best. looking for the people who wanted to be Pete Podgy when they grew up. Yeah, Pete, and Pete's it, already it, at the top. It, yeah, It fell flat, flatter than a pancake, primarily because oh. I can't take my own advice, which is why you and I both have business co- uh, a business coach, because it's, it's hard to do that. So the point yeah. being, ladies and gentlemen, uh, test your product out first. Find one or two elements, the most minimal viable product, and go find people who are potential customers and ask them and probe and do it over and over. Great book. Nail it, then scale it. Covers this perfectly. Uh, but uh, my my buddy John, I know, has got a, a story or two like You tell it on me. Years. I'm not sure which failure you're okay, thinking. Okay, so when I, have I say many. failure, so when I say failure, it's not a failure. So after uh, LinkedIn Riches and John was just crushing, it still is, got this awesome. I, I'm, a, I'm a big fan because I was a, a client. You know, everything is step by step done for you. You got the videos. We got the group, man, we're crushing it. Got all the scripts. And then you immediately went out and created a couple more that had some success, but I, I'm pretty sure maybe one of them, I forget which either the webinars or work of the content one that maybe you didn't get to test nearly like you did LinkedIn riches and you, you put a bunch of time, effort and energy in it and it's still there and it still makes money. But it was as big of a product as LinkedIn Riches without the testing and not, not quite frankly, all the success. Do you like humiliating me on my own show? I was, I was, <laughs> I feel like there's one more I didn't even bring up. Shut up. Those are the two I thought. Shut up. That's enough now. No, content marketing machine and webinars that work. Because I was same as you. I was like, I'm a genius. Everyone's buying LinkedIn Riches, the book, the course. I'm just going to do this across multiple verticals. So why wouldn't you? Yeah. Why, so I built this huge online course, webinars that work. Uh, I built this huge online course and a really, I think a really good book, Content Marketing Machine. It is a good book. It is a damn good book. Uh, didn't never sold. I mean, 
to the scale of LinkedIn riches. Sure. Did I make some sales? Yes. Uh, did I have to kill myself to make them? Yes. Um, are they recurring and people are demanding them? No. Um, and, and that's to your point. If I could go back in time, you know, one of the things I did was I figured out, you know, like you said, it wasn't a failure because I can take elements of what I put in those trainings and I bring them in, you know, to client projects now. And, you know, for example, some of the sales training and content marketing machine I give to internal clients. Sure. And so, so there's still uses for it, but to your point, like, yes, I should have definitely tested just the idea of, do you know, do you want to use webinars for your business? Do you want to playbook? Do you want a blueprint? You know what I mean? With yeah. my audience. Cause yes, people buy it from other people, but the people that was the other thing too, is like, I kind of realized not that I got pigeonholed, but that people keep wanting LinkedIn from me, which right. is not a bad thing. So right. scale that gold mine up <clears throat> and the side projects to your point, you got to test them first and not put all that blood, sweat and tears into it. And then be like, Oh man, no one wants it. Cause you you have, yeah. um, there's a great scene in the movie um, Sea Biscuit where Jeff Bridges opens a bicycle shop and he's he's got all the bikes in there, right. and he's, you know, brushing the front step and he's polishing and then he's waiting for customers to come in and no one comes in. And Good. he's all day, all night sitting yeah. there bored. And yeah. that I always think of that analogy of like he didn't test bicycles in that town. Like no one wanted one, you know. They, so. Yeah, and and with you or even, you know, my little example, it, it that's fine. You can survive it because you're doing it as you've already opened. I see yeah. people do it when they're, you know, you're ballparking my age when they've hit that. And I don't, whatever you call it, midlife crisis or existential thing. I've heard you tell the story dozens of times about looking out of the window with a safe job thinking, man, I've got to be something else. And then some of those folks will go crack open the 401k and put it all into a large product, large service, no testing, because that's what they've always wanted to do. And then whew, they're back at work. Yeah. Yeah. It's brutal. Yeah. And it definitely, to your point earlier, confidence, and I would say cojones are very much sure. needed to ride this out. Like I think for anybody, and that's, again, if you, what I like about your book is you don't have to do the leap like I did where I took out a home equity loan and I was in debt yeah. for months and years. And like, I had to ride that out, but a lot of people, don't have the stomach or the spouse like I did, who's like, right. it's okay. <laughs> you know, like, That's right. So let's get into, because obviously the appeal of yours is they don't have to take all the crazy risks. So what, you know, what is one of the most simple things you say that 90% of business owners miss when they're kind of starting and trying to scale these oh, side hustles? Man, it sounds so woo woo to say, but I can promise you it's very real. I, I had to relearn this during the, uh, the quarantine, but it's, they lack focus. And when I say focus, I don't mean in this, if you think it, you know, it will, you know, believe it and it will show up in front of your face, uh, secret style. But when I say focus, when I talk to people, like the number one answer say, John, how you been? They, they always say, well, I've just been so what I've been so busy. Well, I just been so, we just wear like this weird badge of honor. Like I'm just driving my kids everywhere and I'm answering emails and I'm returning texts and I'm going to meetings. I'm just busy, busy, busy. When you take on a business, in addition to your full-time duties, which are, are quote-unquote busy, uh, you don't have time to jack around playing around in your inbox half the day or rechecking that Instagram post or the latest tweet to make sure it's just right. You've got to focus all your time, effort, and energy on the things that are the biggest, the things that uh, matter the most. So you've got to really figure out what those high-priority items are that only you can do and you need to have blocks of time. And if anybody's listening, write this down. You need hour or an hour and a half of blocks of time to focus and do one singular thing all the way through. Uh, most people, they try to start a business on the side with 10 minutes here and uh, five minutes there and right before I go to bed or right as I wake up or a little bitty here at lunch. That does not work. Your brain, tons of science to back this up, doesn't work that way. It can't jump from item to item to item and find real traction or real success. I mean, there's a ton of research that shows you got to be into something about 23 minutes or so to really be into that flow state, so to speak, and to get real work done. And the reason I say, you know, I, I relearned this during the quarantine is because, you know, as a small business coach counselor, 
you know, they're shutting everything down. I became a, a point of contact for anybody and any anyone under the sun that were trying to get these SBA loans or figure out what the new rules were going to be or what, you know, what could we do or what couldn't we do? And my phone and email, everything was just exploding. Dude, I felt like I was working a uh, as a CSR job, third shift in a foreign country, trying to tell people that, you know, Comcast cable would be back up soon. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So I'm, I'm blasting through all this stuff and it's all just fractioned yeah. and then i've got my poor kids they kept coming in and interrupting me one at a time daddy can you help me get on zoom because you know we're homeschool teachers cool. all of a sudden and the school's not prepared for it and daddy can you help me charge the laptop daddy i, I don't know how to use google classroom and i remember slamming the door telling them in not nice daddy words daddy's busy he can't be distracted right now and then sitting down as I went through uh, an email somebody had sent me, somebody I hadn't seen in a while, well, tell me about the latest on this PPP. Do I have to pay it back? Pay, payroll protection program. Well, let me let me see. Yesterday you didn't, and today you might. So I went online and checked. And then I checked the email, and that email reminded me something I saw on LinkedIn. So I want to go over there real quick. So I got to LinkedIn, and I saw, oh, I got some messages. I love messages. So I jump over there, and it said, somebody's asking me about the uh, the IDL, you know, econo which is a terrible name for a loan, by the way, IDL. Uh, economic injury disaster. Well, let me check either way. You see where I'm going. I thought, oh, sugar, honey, iced tea. I'm doing the exact same thing I just told my kids I couldn't do. So either way, at that point, I have been on an absolute mission, uh, Deep Work, another book to recommend Great by book. Cal Newport. I have read it, reread it. It looks like, uh, you know, I might be uh, on the FBI most wanted list the way I've written into the margins. It looks like a mad person did it. But that book, really helped save me and gave me time to to make this thing while I'm already this thing. Listeners, I, I was holding a book. Uh, that's how <laughs> nice I created... product placement on oh an audio gosh. podcast. No kidding. Sorry, folks. <laughs> hey, it's all right. It's I'm our first learning. time, everybody. It's it our is. first time. So look, I, I, all of that to say, the sound unfocused, you've got to block out big chunks of time. Without that, this will not work. I love it. Yeah, it's so true. And I think uh, I like too what you said about, you know, you didn't say the exact words, but the high leverage activities. Yes. Like you only have so like it's what's going to move it. the needle? What's going to move the needle for your business? Is it, you know, getting the validation of the idea? Is it doing a sales call? Is it really, you know, designing the, the Instagram photo image and photo right. editor by yourself? Or could you, you know, use now, you know, the AI tools or hire yeah. a, a nerd for, you know, five bucks to do it, you know? Sure. So, so I think that's, that's that key element, the focus and the time. So let's talk about scaling because obviously, every, you know, let's say you're, uh, you've validated your idea. People want to give you money for this, yeah. this product, this service. Okay. This looks like something can go here. Like people want it. They're willing to give me money. I've got some customers. Take me through the steps to scaling. How do you scale the right way? So the right way, and it, it's not the easiest way, but man, I'm telling you, it is the right way. So go ahead and allow yourself to just get immersed in the business. You try to do all the things start that way. But then what I've done for myself and other clients in it's simple. Keep a spreadsheet of everything you're doing every minute of every day and do it for just a two or three day period, which is, it's not fun, but man, it is a massive eye opener. So that immediately, once you have that list, you can kind of look through it. How long did I spend checking email? How long did I, you know, play around with uh, this LinkedIn article that I was trying to publish, you know, and, and once you start looking at, you'll see patterns and you'll see primarily you're skipping around all over the place. But secondarily, you can identify what you just called high leverage items. I always call them like your priority list. You know, if I do these things well, everything else has to fall into place. So start identifying those. And what you do is you create this whole list of this task list of things that somebody else could probably do. So then I take all of those things and you, you can put them into categories. You can either... Um, Batch them, which might still be something you do. But remember what I'm telling you, you work for an hour focus at a time. It, let's say you're doing your own QuickBooks and you're not willing to give it up yet. Okay, well, don't skip back and forth with the little journal entries. Block out from 3 to 4.30 on Friday afternoon when you're burnt out. Batch those items together. Uh, the next thing will be to automate anything humanly possible. Man, we live in a beautiful age and John Nemo has done it better than anybody. Automate any and everything you possibly can. All the Google tools, 
the the forms that feed into other forms use project management tools like Asana, use uh, a CRM like PipeDrive that ties to Gmail, use uh, Zapier to tie every, and I don't even know if I'm saying that right. Zapper, Zapier. I would say Zapier, but I think it is Zapier, Zapier. like because they say Zaps, but I'm you know they don't whatever. Say Charles. I don't we'll say whatever, whatever we want right either. Zaping uh, and vaping, that's me. Either way, the tools are there. So automate it. You don't have to do it all at once, you know, and it's stuff will break, but do it. I'll automate the stuff. Then you start delegating. And when yeah. I say delegate, I've got a VA. I've had one for three years. I works, you know, 10, 15 hours a week, does all the things I don't want to do anymore. And I learned how to put together a one page SOP, standard operating procedure. Anything I've caught myself doing more than once. I think, man, somebody somebody else could do this. Um, and, you know, for not not many dollars an hour, I'll create a one-page SOP. I'll even create a video of me doing whatever it is. So, you know, you, you're, you know, LinkedIn, big, big leverage point for me. So right now I'm offering people on LinkedIn the three, three free chapters to start now, quit later. Good book, by the way, uh, where... You know, if they reply, yes, I'm not taking the time to individually go in and hit, you know, send, I don't do that. Janie, Janie does that for me. She'll send it, send them an email and then she'll save the email and she, she knows all the things to do with it. She's in charge of my LinkedIn newsletter. She's in charge of all of that stuff. So after you've batched, after you've automated, after you've delegated my favorite topic, John, say no, quit doing some stuff. And if you think you can't quit doing it, just try. The world's not going to come to an end. Armageddon isn't going to hit. Just give it up for a little while. Just see what happens if you don't serve on the next committee or board, or if you don't reply to some emails of people that want to have a virtual coffee to see if you can leverage and create synergy with common well, resources. Yes. Amen. Just just don't do it and see what happens. I mean, I, I quote Warren Buffett here. He said the difference between successful people and really success, successful, is that really successful people say no to almost everything. I love doing that. So either way, you want to scale your business, you got to figure out first what you're doing. I have too many people that try to reverse engineer it without the end in mind. Well, here's where we want to be. Just do it for a little while. You have complete permission to just get started then backtrack. What am I doing? What What else can I add to those categories and get off my plate? Yeah, that's genius advice. And, and even like a practical tool I'm using right now to kind of give give an idea of the automation levels. So I'll re I'll use Loom, which is L O O M dot com. It's just a screen recording. You can get the premium for seven bucks a month or else it's free up to five minutes. But Loom dot com and I will record myself on the screen doing a task and I will dictate and just say, OK, right now I'm going over here. I'm clicking here. I'm doing this. I'm clicking that. I'm highlighting this. I'm making a copy of that. And then what you can do is you have a Loom video of you showing them how to do the task, and it gives you a free transcript, which you now yeah. copy paste the transcript into ChatGPT and say, turn this transcript into a step-by-step -step instruction yep. based on this video. And now you have a written out, you know, step-by-step uh, -step doc yep. with a video, and now that task is done for infinity for someone else to come in and do. So, so there's lots of ways to bottle up your time. But to Charles's point, I do agree, like you have to do the task and be good at it and master it mm -hmm. so that you're able to know what a job well done looks like when you offload it. That's the other thing is. Dude, yes. Uh, yeah. Com and completely off topic. This has been a, a, a something John has talked about for a while. I've, I've had a lot of people that want to outsource their selling. Now, John's got a product he can sell. He knows how it works. He's done it. So when he outsources it, even though there's trials and tribulations, it's not because the product doesn't sell, but I have too many people that are in startup phase, year one, year two. I yeah. even have some that are at year 10 that still can't sell their product. And then they complain to me about the commission only salesperson that can't sell. It's like, well, first you need to get a proof of concept. You need to sell yes. first before yes. you, but anyway, it goes to your point, figure out how to do it on your own. You don't have to be great at it. I use QuickBooks as an example. I mean, most of the small business owners I've worked with will have a borderline seizure when I show them a row of numbers that they have to add because they don't like it. And I get that. But at least have some vague idea of how it works and then then outsource it. Yeah. Yeah. Great stuff. I mean, I think it's that's the key is you've got to figure out how to optimize your time so you can do the high leverage activities that only you can do. Right. And that's how right. you really scale is. 
you obviously bring in people and processes and tools and templates and automation. And it's like you said, you just give yourself permission to, to make that part of the process. It doesn't happen overnight. So let's, let's pivot. Let's pivot to pivot. the person who says, you know what? I got this going. I've scaled it up. I'm feeling yeah. pretty good. I'm kind of wondering how do I know if it's the right time to quit my day job and take this full time and, sure. and cut the safety net off? Like, is there a, is there a hard and true test? Is it up to the person? Like, how do you address that? couple of ways. First and foremost, make sure you have a conversation with a spouse, kids, in-laws, outlaws first. Oh my God, dude. I found out the hard way that I'm a pretty good business counselor and I've got a very good marriage, but I suck at marriage counseling. And I have had entirely too many couples in my office where one leaves in tears and it's, you know, not to, not to stereotype, but it's not always the female. Sometimes it's, it's hubby that has stormed out because they weren't on the same page. Yeah. Talk, talk to the family members or whoever else relies on you, figure that part out first. So the next step is, even though I just said people don't like doing it, do a quick little cash flow projection. It doesn't, doesn't have to be anything formal or brilliant, but it's pretty simple concept. You know how much your monthly budget is. And if you don't for your home, gosh, that's the first step. I've been teaching a financial scorekeeping workshop for small business owners. And I, I, I had to add personal budgeting to the list of things I was teaching because I realized a lot of people aren't doing it. But if you're, so nerd wallet says the average household of five has to have about seven grand to, you know, be normal. Okay. So how far below is the side business at, you know, if it's at five grand, okay, no worries. If you go full time, maybe we could get it up to seven, no problem. But do you have some cash in reserves? I always recommend try to get to about three to six months of your monthly home fixed expenses saved. Once you have that, and then you're close to making what you were making before, then you're in a position to where you can rip that Band-Aid off. Uh, and I, you know, I have some people that, you know, go overboard with it and have all the money in the world and still won't do it. And then I've got some that rather they're ready to skip out once they've made that first hundred bucks and they've got, you know, they're living on a credit card. Don't do that either. Yeah. Uh, I wouldn't but, recommend that. But, I did that, but I wouldn't recommend it. <laughs> well, it, but, but have, have, I identify what I call, you know, it's the financial gap. Yes, absolutely. The, the, and, make sure everybody in the family is also on board because there will be some lean time. So if you've got to have it now, if we go to Outback every Friday, well, maybe mom and daddy need to grill this Friday instead, or maybe we need to throw some, you know, some bologna on the smoker and just call it a day. Uh, but, you know, cut it. We have to sacrifice. There might be some vacation cutting, might be some trimming, but Save save actual dollars and see how close you are to, to making the monthly uh, payments at home to keep everybody happy. Yeah, I think that's great advice. Obviously, I really look at my own story. I really took for granted how supportive my wife was when mm -hmm. we had the, like we called it the balance transfer game where she would just keep shifting the money to the next 0% <laughs> card. Yeah. And um, at one point I had to go get a home equity loan to keep the business going and pay. And it was humiliating. And I had to go into a bank and I felt like the biggest loser on earth. Sure. And, she sat there and said, I believe in you. Like, you got this. You're going to be fine. Like, knock it off. And I remember our coach, John Morgan, said to me, you will always be fine because you know how to sell. He's I like, was going to say, because John Nemo can sell. He's like, so you're always going to, like, you have that licks. Like, so you'll be able to get money. And it, But again, that's that whole thing about you got to have that support team. And if your spouse isn't on board or whatever, then, yeah, you need to, that needs to be a team decision for sure. Uh, and then I love the idea to, if I was to go back and tell myself in 2012, like, hey, I'm so glad you want to leave. You got a client. You got a side hustle going. Let's set a goal. What What are you and Sarah, my wife, comfortable with mm -hmm. before you leave? Like, is it just to clear out the debt? Is it to get three months of living expenses? What are those, by the way? Do a budget, idiot. Right. Like, figure out, you know. Yeah. And then that would have given me that carrot to, to hustle on the side right. and at night and on weekends and go, Okay, I'm closer. I'm closer. I'm closer. That's I'm right. closer. And then also once, build once that. Once I hit this level, I I can I can do this all the time. And build the belief too, yeah. and validate it even further. That okay, now I'm up to three mm -hmm. clients, no end in sight. I got ten more leads. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I love this stuff. Well, we could do this all day, but I, I, as we bring this in for landing, is there anything I didn't mention about our conversation today about the book um, that you think is really useful and helpful to share? Uh. Other useful things in there. I mean, I go, the book goes all things through the stuff that they don't tell you to 
break it down. Everything in my my mind breaks down to marketing, management, and financial. And marketing probably being the heaviest one because sales 101 training tells you nothing happens until something is sold. And the book is full of stories. Stories are how I learn best. They're about clients I've had, about personal, my own personal life, uh, about my experiences. And then we break everything down in, into the nitty gritty and make sure that it's actionable. So the things I tell people, just other just bits of advice is don't wait to get started. Go ahead and get started. The biggest, one of the biggest hurdles I always see is that folks think they need a 50 page business plan that would go in the trash right away. And secondarily, there's the number one thing I hear over and over 16 years I've done this is Charles, I don't want to get in trouble and I want to make sure everything is legal. <laughs> and I have to, you know, I, I laugh, I apologize, but man, like we're not running a moonshine distillery in the twenties. It's not illegal. It's not a cartel. Yeah. <laughs> virtually every state in the union, Tennessee being a great one, you're allowed to generate several thousand dollars before you formalize anything. And then even on top of that, look, there's not a man in a black trench coat and a briefcase is going to come knocking on your door because you made some money. I was talking to, wasn't even a client of mine. It was, I was at my daughter's dance studio talking to a mom who I knew, knew no owns a vinyl lettering business. I said, Hey, how's the business going? Oh, well, we had to quit. I'm like what happened? I was making too much money. Dude, what? What do you mean you made what? too much money? Like, well, we had to pay too much in taxes. Oh my like, gosh. Sweet mother of pearl. Right. They, it, and, and I didn't go into it. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna be her shrink right on the spot. You know, that that wasn't because she made too much money, it's because they were worried about success and yeah. Uh, you know, they went back to a toddler mindset. Well, I don't want to get in trouble or I don't want to be illegal. Just start. Nobody, I swear, nobody's paying you any attention. Get some business insurance. There's your line of defense. Yeah. Just get started. If you get to a point where you're making so much money, you don't know what to do with, great. That's an awesome problem to have. Then we'll formalize. But before then, uh, if you get in, if you quote unquote get in trouble, you'll be the first I've heard of uh, out of a uh, couple thousand folks. You know what I like to say, Charles, is start now, quit later. Oh, what a brilliant. <laughs> That's brilliant a good book title. title. Dude, I, 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 like, mean, I might write a book with that title. Uh, Okay. All kidding aside, my friend, this has been awesome. We're obviously the book is available now yeah. on Amazon. It's on Audible. Yep. You narrated it, correct? Yes. So for anybody who likes torture, um, come on now. I I prefer the Southern <laughs> Twang. I love the, I love it. <laughs> Look, I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, it. it I, I was happy to do my own book. I offer a lot of inflection. I'm telling stories that I lived through, so I think it adds a fun little element to it. The torture portion being. Man, not everybody likes to hear their own voice. So then you do it for five straight hours and then you have to go back and edit it. And then I've discovered as I was doing it, it was like I had a split personality, like the narrator Charles kept getting mad at the editor and editor Charles was really upset with the narrator. That's funny. Anywho, but yes, dude, it's Kindle, it's paperback, it's uh, it's audible. You can find it on Amazon today. Today, I just got ranked number one new, uh, what was on uh, the list? I'm... Number one new seller on uh, Amazon. New uh, release. All, yes. Yeah. yeah. Number one new release. Thank you for clearing that out. It's already in the top 10 uh, ranking for small business books right there with Guy Kawasaki and, you know, how I built this with uh, Guy Roz and I guess other people named Guy. Uh, but it's it's locked and loaded. And you can also go to my website, yourcharlesalexander.com. I have a link for it there. And just as important, I've also got the beginning of my course that I'm going to test before completely filling it out on start now, quit later course. I've got four modules up ready to go where we've got video audio. We've got the worksheets. I've got the transcription. I even give you the slides because there's always one person in every class that wants the slides for some reason. Uh, so go there, get, take the course, read the book, contact me, see if I can help you. I love it. So it's Start Now, Quit Later by Charles Alexander on Amazon and Audible. I'm just going to go get a copy and highlight all the John Nemo pages. You know? you? <laughs> He's in there. Okay, good. I love that guy. Big fan. And then um, obviously your charlesalexander.com for one-on-one -on -one business coaching. Just great stuff, my friend. Thank you so much for coming on Nemo Radio. Dude, love it. Thanks. Thanks.